We're going to read our text today at the end of the sermon. You'll see why. It's going to be a demonstration of the beauty of the Scriptures. Today we're going to talk about honoring the Holy Bible. Can we say the Holy Bible? The word Bible is a transliteration of the Greek word for book, which is biblos. And so it's not just any book, it's the holy book, the holy Bible. Living in the day in which we live, it seems everything is having to be reproven again. All beliefs are being questioned, so this is where I'm coming from. And it's somewhat understandable because when you watch the news, who do you believe? When most of the news are opinion experts, I mean, who tunes tunes into the Super Bowl to watch the experts talk? You want to see the action, right? I have a news app called Haystack, and you establish your location and your interest, and it creates multiple clips from multiple newscasts. So I'm always moving from one another a la carte, trying to distinguish what is going on in the world without listening to a bunch of opinions. The church has leaders in it that are not necessarily helping. We have a national leader that has pretty much denounced the Old Testament. Now, I do not believe we are, as Gentiles, are living under the law of Moses, but the Old Testament is the basis of the gospel. What do you think the early church preached from? Hello, did we crawl out from some other rock? And now recently he's began to denounce certain scriptures in the New Testament he doesn't like by labeling them clobber verses. Now I know we can pick verses out, pick and choose and use them to beat one another up. That's not good. But there's a slow slide into a liberal theology where none of it matters and it will destroy churches and destroy people's faith, not the faith that The faith is indestructible. The gospel is true. Amen? Amen. 13 years ago, I conducted an informal survey in preparation for a sermon series I did called Tough Questions Thinking People Are Asking. And we came up with 10 of the top questions. I sent out, uh, at that time, I had 500 email and Facebook contacts. It would be a whole lot more than that now than I did. And uh, came up with the top 40 questions people are asking, and then I sent links to them and beyond to a survey put out by surveymonkey.org and came up with the top 10. And uh, some of those that were least in the list uh, didn't make the top 10 are somewhat humorous. We won't cover that. But the number one question thinking people were asking or we believe people are asking is how do you know the Bible is true? At that time, 13 years ago, 73% of those surveyed thought this question was very important, while 21% thought of it as important, and only 6% thought it was an unimportant question. Such a subject may not interest you because it's a settled matter in your mind, but you need to review the fact because it's not a settled matter in other people's minds. You may think you're too old to be involved in discipling someone or evangelizing someone, but let me tell you, ministry begins right in your own home with your own kinfolks. They're questioning things about your beliefs, and you can no longer just say, well, the Bible says. You've got to establish a baseline for quoting the Bible, and so that's the point from which we are coming today. In obedience to 1 Peter 3.15, which is inside the text we're going to read at the end of this talk, It says to always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope, the living hope that is in you. So I'm endeavoring to answer this important question again. How do you know the Bible is true in honor of the holiest of books? In your notes, we've entitled it Honoring the Holy Bible, Why This Sacred Book Should Be Honored and Believed. Why This Sacred Book Should Be Honored and Believed. The Bible has no peer in ancient literature. Out of all the ancient books and writings that are out there, nothing even begins to compare to the Bible. I don't care what the History Channel says. They can try to diminish it and put it on equal ground with what other old people may have written years ago. 
It is the most reliable of old manuscripts in terms of the sheer number, the age of the manuscripts, and the distance in age of the manuscripts we have from their origination. Aristotle wrote his writings around 350 BC, of which there are only five ancient manuscripts that are dated at 1100 AD, thus placing them 1,450 years away from the actual time he wrote his original copy. The New Testament has multiple manuscripts, I'll share it in a minute, going back to the same century in which they were written. Here's a, here's a, a picture of this. Lucretius is an ancient writer. He died around 50, 53 BC. Uh, the time between his writing and the copy which we have, which we only have two copies of his, is at 1,100 years in space between 53 B.C. and the time we wrote it. So it's about 1050 A.D. is when they found these manuscripts or when they discovered that they were written at that age. Pliny lived around A.D. 61 to 113. Uh, the earliest copy we have of his writings is 850 A.D. Plato lived between 427 and 347 B.C. And the earliest writing we have of him is dated at A.D. 900. That's 1,200 years. Caesar, his Gaelic Wars book was written in his lifetime between 44 B.C. and 100 B.C. So he lived before Augustus. And the earliest copy we have of his, we have 10 copies. They're dated at 900 A.D. So that's 1,000 years in space. There's Aristotle. He lived between 384, 322 B.C. His writings are dated that we have copies, 49 copies of, are dated at around 1,100 A.D. So it's over 1,400, around 1,400 years between the actual writing and the date of the copies that we have. All right, the New Testament was written between 50 and 100 A.D., or A.D. 100. We have 5,600 fragments and whole books. And their age go back to less than 100 years. And their accuracy is 99.5% accurate. So where would the 5% accuracy be? It could be Penmanship could be spelling, could be punctuation. It's minuscule. God used holy men of God to write the scriptures, inspired by his spirit in their own words, through their own personality. It wasn't automatic handwriting. They wrote the revelation given to them. So the Bible has no peer in ancient literature. The Bible has no peer in modern literature. Literature. The world's first printed book was a Bible. The world's most expensive book is a Bible. The most widely read book in history is the Bible. The most widely read book every year is the Bible. The number one international spell speller seller each year is the Bible. Globally, 100 million copies are printed each year, most of which are distributed around the world. Annually, here in this country, 20 million Bibles are sold. And ironically, most of those are being printed in China, to my dismay. Or maybe it's a good thing. We'll see. But be sure and, re be sure and keep one of the original ones that you had to compare the two. Being printed in China. The longest telegram in history was the New Testament. The largest first edition of any book in history was the Bible. The Bible continues to be the most translated book in the world, with 724 complete Bibles out there in languages. 724 languages now have a complete copy of the Scriptures that are being printed and distributed. And 1,617 uh, other languages have the whole New Testament. And there's projects working on 3,589 other languages. These numbers change from when I preached this message 13 years ago. Ironically, the Bible is also the most stolen book in history. 
It's true. Bible bookstores have to have security. Isn't that terrible? But it's the Word of God. It's free. I understand how people could justify that. The Gideons occasionally have to replenish the Bibles in the hotels. So hopefully people that are taking them are reading them, which is awesome. You may have a Gideon Bible from a hotel. No guilt. Enjoy it. They'd be thrilled. The Bible has harmony in spite of its contrary elements. Listen to this. It's a volume of 66 books written over a span of 1,500 years in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, on three continents, Africa, Europe, and Asia. These books were written by 40 writers who were fishermen, shepherds, farmers, kings, prophets, priests, an architect, a poet, a physician, a lawyer slash tax collector, and a tent maker slash lawyer named Paul, who's heard of Paul. They wrote in different settings, including prisons, palaces, boats, houses, and tents, in the desert, in cities, in villages, and on the sea, and in jail. During times of war and peace, travel and captivity, prosperity and famine, loss and restoration, these men of God wrote about hundreds of controversial subjects with amazing unity. In spite of their cultural, class, and historical differences, it is easy to see the miraculous nature of this book we call the Bible. Now, you may honor the Bible. You may have it in a special place in your house, and occasionally you have to dust it to keep the dust off of it because you never read it. We do not worship the Bible, but we gain wisdom for worshiping Almighty God from the contents of the Bible. Can I get an amen? I believe the harmony in this book exists because biblical writers were inspired by God to write what they wrote, making him its ultimate author and them the writers, even though they use their own personal words, idioms, and styles of expression. For 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Even though it was written during times of scientific misunderstanding, the Bible includes scientific facts. Early astronomers believed that we could count the stars, while the Bible said it was not possible. Ptolemy counted 1,056 Kepler thought he saw 1,005 stars, and Tycho Brahe came up with a magic number. He said there were 777 stars. There are some numbers preachers out there that would get excited. Problem is, not true. The invention of the telescope and this latest thing has just continued to reveal these things cannot be counted. Jeremiah 33, 22, for centuries before Christ, declared the host of heaven cannot be numbered. Modern science has also discovered that all matter is made up of invisible atoms. For almost 2,000 years, the Bible has said this very thing. Hebrews 11.3, the things which are seen are made of things which are not visible. For centuries, it was believed the earth was flat. There's still some flat earthers out there. While well, the Bible referred to it as round, Isaiah 40, 22, the circle of the earth is spoken of there. And I verified it with an Orthodox Jew who looked it up in the Talmud, and they go to town on explaining Isaiah 40, 22, that the earth is round. When people had little concept of planets and the universe, Job 26, 7, and these are the words of Job, not those comforters. When you quote Job, you better be sure who's talking. Spoke of the earth being hung upon nothing. World discoverers were inspired by the scriptures, and the founder of oceanography was moved to study the oceans by a verse that speaks of the paths of the sea. Ecclesiastes 1.17 and Amos 9.6 refer to what we now understand as a hydrologic cycle, how the waters come from the ocean and come down upon us. In 1644 AD, Evangelista Torricelli, 
Isn't that an awesome Italian name? Discovered that air has weight. But for centuries, Job 28, 25, Job said this, said that God established weight for the wind. Isn't that awesome? The medical field at one time practiced bleeding as a treatment for certain ailments. It has since been proven to be harmful for the sick. <laughs> While for centuries, Levit Leviticus 17, 14 said, these are Moses' writings, blood is the life of all flesh. Its blood sustains its life. Our first president died on December 14, 1799 at the age of 67 from a sore throat. how that happen? He didn't feel good. He had a sore throat, so his butler bled him. And then uh, he reached out to his barber, and his barber bled him. And then finally his doctor came over. Man, I still don't feel good. <laughs> his doctor bled him, and the old man never recovered. The father of our nation... Meanwhile, the Bible says life is in the blood. The practice of circumcision has been proven to greatly reduce the cases of cervical cancer in the lives of the wives of circumcised men. It has also been proven that the eighth day of, an eight of a male's life, the prescription given by God was to circumcise the male Hebrew's child on the eighth day. On the eighth day of a young male's life, prothrombin, a clotting agent in our blood, is 10% higher on that day than any day before or after. Can the men say, ouch? So it's an ideal time on the eighth day. Who knew? The need to wash our hands with running water after touching a sick or dead person was prescribed in the Bible for centuries before the medical profession made it an official part of their practice. Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis and his breakthrough discovery of cadaverous poisoning led to the developing of what is called germ theory, which really isn't theory anymore. Meanwhile, the Old Testament laws were previously ignored by the medical profession. It's discoveries like this that prove the inspiration of the scriptures. What he discovered in, I think it was in Vienna, a certain hospital that had a high rate of women dying in childbirth. And so the doctors examining the, the dead bodies of the women that died to try to see what was going on without washing their hands would leave the dead mother and then go and examine a living mother to make sure she was healthy and didn't have the same disease without washing her hands. And when... Approached with this theory, Ignaz Semmelweis was made fun of and mocked. You know, the Civil War, we lost on both sides, plus the slaves that gave their lives, uh, over 600,000 people. I've read varying numbers as high as 700,000. A big chunk of that was from the hands of doctors. In Fort Worth is a Civil War museum. It's themed around Texas' involvement in the Civil War. And yes, Texas did get involved. Their Articles of Succession mentioned slavery as a reason to want to succeed from the Union. But in that is a big display of the medical devices these doctors used. It's horrifying the pain the wounded went through. And think of these devices not being sterilized. Gangrene was running rampant. I mean, just crazy things, whereas the Bible would have remedied a lot of this. The concept of quarantine is you keep the sick away from the well. That's in the Bible. Our government kind of got carried away with it recently by quarantining the healthy. All right, I don't want to stir that up. Archaeology continues to confirm biblical records. In the 19th century, skeptics believed that Abraham never existed and that Moses could not have written the Torah because writing had not yet been invented. Both of these theories and others like them have been thoroughly disproven by biblical archaeology. You can Google these things, check these things out, anything that I'm saying. I would love to have conversations with you at another time, though. More than one archaeologist has found increased respect for the Bible 
from their own experience in excavating in the Holy Land. Using the Bible as a guide, Nelson Gluck discovered over a thousand ancient sites. So vast is the evidence here that I only make mention of it and encourage you to do some digging and research this for yourself. And you could start with the website of the Christian Research Institute, and they could direct you to other places. And check out the Biblical Archaeological Review, which you can Google that and find that. Another reason for honoring the Bible is many prophecies have and are coming to pass. The life of Christ alone, as recorded from by eyewitnesses, fulfilled over 300 prophecies that had been dormant for centuries in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant Scriptures, the First Testament, the Hebrew Bible. He comes along and fulfills them. If you run the laws of chance, it's astronomical that one person will fulfill all these. Well, couldn't he have read the Bible and set out to live a life to fulfill these things? Well, you can't do that with a resurrection. And you certainly can't do that with where you're going to be born, right? So anyway, the religion of Judaism, which rejects Jesus as a Messiah, still preserves faith in the Hebrew prophecies, which predated Jesus' earthly life for centuries. And their devotion has helped prevent any prophetic hoaxes. They wouldn't let us get by with it. The historical scattering of the Jewish people across the earth was the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, and the regathering of them to their original homeland is a present-day fulfillment of biblical prophecy, as are the conversions of many of them to the faith in the Lord as a Messiah. We heard about that three Sundays ago with Boris Grushenko, leader of the largest Messianic congregation in the Ukraine, and he is seeing congregations planted all over Europe based on the members of his congregation that have had to flee for their safety. They're starting churches other places. And of course, we've had Michael Sadowski speak here three times, the leader of the largest Jewish congregation in the land of Israel. They, I think there's over 200 congregations that believe Yeshua is the Messiah. This is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Read the words of Jesus in Matthew 24 or Luke 21 and watch the real news and you'll see why I believe the Bible is true. There's wars and rumors of wars. Nations are rising against nations. And that's not just countries with borders. That is ethnic groups within borders rising against each other. There's famines, pestilences and diseases. There's false prophets and deception, false teachers and false teachings, lawlessness and rebellion. The love of many is growing cold because of that. Persecution of the righteous. Men's hearts are failing them for fear. Selfishness and stressfulness, materialism and greed. Homosexuality is increasing and gender confusion as a result of this. There's calls for peace and yet there is no peace. There's earthquakes and natural disasters. There's earthquakes going on somewhere right now. Some of them are not as damaging as the horrible one that happened in Turkey last week, but they're there. These are the fulfillment of the words of Jesus. The Bible has survived many efforts to destroy it. It continues to be printed, read, and believed in spite of past and present efforts to discredit it. The famous author Voltaire denounced and predicted the Bible's demise, but years after his death, his own house became the home of a Bible publishing society. After writing some excellent papers on freedom, Thomas Paine wrote The Age of Reason, of which he said, this will destroy the Bible. Within a hundred years, Bibles will only be found in museums and used bookstores. Later, he recanted and lamented, I would give worlds if I had them, had The Age of Reason never been written. His book became the scourge that tormented him until his death, and the Bible is still here. In our lifetime, governments have and are denouncing the Bible or are restricting its availability to their citizens. But as the old song says, his truth is marching on. Can we say yes? yes. Watch places like China and North Korea and the Islamic world. They will surely fail to suppress this mighty book. In fact, while it may seem suspicious, China is the main publisher of Bibles sold in this country right now. 
The Bible continues to change lives for good. But right now, let's deal with efforts to destroy the Bible. One is the belief that monks changed it. It's not pure. In fact, Islam teaches this. Yes, the Bible is the word of God, but you cannot trust it because the monks contaminated it. Well, let's think about that for a minute. The Bible had spread across the Roman Empire in its infancy. Organically, books are being written. 321 AD, Constantine was used to call the bishops together to, to kind of help them get organized and to begin to back off the persecution that was on them. Unfortunately, over the centuries, the Roman Empire infiltrated the church, but the original meetings were a good thing, and they compiled their list of they, the books they believed were inspired. It wasn't like there was a Bible and they ripped books out of it. it, was a, it there was no New Testament, and the, the Hebrew nation kept preserved the Hebrew Bible, but the Greek side of it, the New Testament, the New Covenant Scriptures, was compiled together by church leaders from across the Roman Empire of the books they found most helpful and reliable. Well, what about the book of Thomas? You really want to include the book of Thomas in the Bible? It wasn't written during the lifetime of Thomas, and it wasn't written by Thomas, and it states women can't go to heaven. In fact, it states for Mary to go to heaven, she has to be made into a man. That'll tell you what spirit this gender confusion is part of. But what about the monks? Did they have the means by which to change the Bible around the world? Here's a humorous uh, look at that concept. Could monks have changed the story of Jesus? Monks didn't even exist until the Middle Ages. By then, thousands of copies of Jesus' story existed the monks would have had to track down thousands of copies across three continents in four different languages. They would have to have perfect forgery penmanship in Greek, Latin, Syriac, and Coptic. The copies were highly revered and guarded as priceless treasures, so not getting caught doing this would be impressive. They would have to learn to lie in all those languages in order to fool the audience. They would have to silence those who noticed the changes. All of this is very hard to believe, since these thousands of copies are near identical. We won't belabor it, but I could rant and rave about that. There are those who have used the Bible to promote injustice and suffering in the world, but those doing so did it out of ignorance and rebellion and gross misinformation because when rightly understood, the opposite results from Bible reading. The Civil War happened in this nation to end chattel slavery because of the Bible. This book continues to change lives for good. The world is a better place because of the Bible. When properly understood, nations have abolished things like genocide and Chattel slavery and prostitution, courageous people have allowed the Bible's authority to promote justice in their culture, accepted injustice in history, like infanticide, have faced successful opposition from those who are truly impacted by the truth of the Scripture. The pro-life movement is basically a pro-Bible movement. Matthew Paris, an atheist, In the London Times wrote an article, you ought to look it up, it's called, I Truly Believe Africa Needs God. And in that article, he recognizes the contributions of missionaries to that great continent and how they need more because they deal with some extreme things in some of their cultures with the dictators. The Bible needs to have a greater impact. Biblical application has blessed me personally. Taking the principles from the Scriptures seriously has stabilized and strengthened my family, our relationships, and personal business transactions. The faith and hope that comes from believing the Bible's promises have encouraged us when struggling with difficult circumstances of all kinds, from the days of our youth until now. Can I get an amen, babe? 
Being married for 45 years plus now, we give credit to the truth of the Bible's commands and principles to which my wife and I are both committed for applying to ourselves and our marriage. We have found that the Bible's wisdom will bring blessing to anyone if applied and obeyed over a course of time. As a pastor, I have seen this to be true many times in the lives of my friends, y'all and all y'all. The final point is the Bible's message can transform your life today. Today, it can change it. The Bible clearly defines and portrays who God is and all that separates us from him, which is sin. This holy book points us to Jesus Christ as the redemedy, as the redemedy, as the remedy through redemption. He is a redemedy for this problem that keeps us from knowing him and one another. Having never succumbed to sinning himself, according to the scriptures, Jesus Christ lived and died as the perfect sacrifice as prescribed by the law in the Old Testament. He died a death he did not deserve so that through our faith in him, we can escape the punishment we do deserve for sinning, thus clearing everything out of the way that separates us from God. This is the good news known as the gospel the New Testament brings to us. We can now have a relationship with Almighty God. The Bible declares that if we will believe in Jesus Christ, we can call on his name and be saved from our sins. You today can experience the truth of the Bible and its promise of freedom from guilt, regret, and the separating consequences of sin. This promise is for all who will call on his name for the forgiveness of their sins in faith in him as their redeemer, their redemity. <laughs> I challenge you right now, wherever you are, to call on the name of the Lord. Let's do it right now. Jesus, Jesus. I call on your name. Save me, Save me from my sins. I believe your death paid for them. And your resurrection allows me to go free. Pray like that, and you can experience amazing reality in your life. Paul wrote to his protege, young Timothy, in his second letter, chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Watch this. It's meant to be opened, explored, pursued. It's made to be read, reread, applied, and used. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, with wisdom, life-changing, to lead us on. It's made for guidance, to teach us His ways, showing what's true, right, and worthy of praise. It's meant to be hidden deep in our hearts, daily examined as the morning starts. No greater glimpse of God do we have, a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. This is the Bible. Where do you stand in relation to it? Do you just honor it as a great book? You have multiple copies, or do you read it? Do you take its contents seriously, or you just read it as a duty? We're honoring the Holy Bible today by looking at part of its contents, 1 Peter 3. The first paragraph deals with wives who have husbands that aren't faithful to God and what to do because you can't make your husband into a mighty man of God, right? You try to do that, it'll backfire on you. And then the next paragraph deals with husbands, how to be more understanding of their wives, and how to live lives that do not have hindered prayers. Who knows, if things are not right with your spouse, and you pray, God will say, talk to the hand. Why? He's your father, but he's also your father-in-law. And he is concerned with how husbands treat his daughters. That's not my subject today. So he concludes that paragraph. The next paragraph 
is where I want to look. Verse 8. Finally, all of you, what is all of you? Husbands and wives both and singles. All of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Now this is life-changing stuff in the Bible. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. You want to be blessed? Stop being vengeful. Stop being hard-hearted. Stop being impolite. I mean, think about it. Why do you want to be rude to people that have the ability to, to share God's blessings in their life? Well, they made me mad. Well, that's no excuse. The Bible says... Love us, brothers, have compassion, be tenderhearted and courteous, and do not return evil for evil or reviling for reviling. On the contrary, blessing. Well, they said something bad about me. How do you know that? Did they say it to your face? No, somebody told you. Anytime somebody comes to you and says, you know, I, I'm not one to gossip, but you need to know this. So-and-so said something really bad about you, blah, blah, blah. My wife and I have agreed what somebody says about me or us is none of our business. What are you doing? Appearing to be loyal? Who knows? You may be doing the same thing on the other side, trying to stir up. Some people are tempted by sowing discord, and God hates that. So you, who wants to inherit a blessing? Do this. And then he quotes Psalm 34, 12 through 16 to back up what he just said. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Why? Verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord, talk to the hand, is against those who do evil. Who wants unhindered prayer? Who wants answers to their prayer? Taking the word seriously will actually reduce your number of prayer requests. We'll always have prayer requests, but rebellion to the word will multiply them. And they may not be answered. Verse 13, who is he? Now, this is all hard to do, right? But this is what God calls us to do. Now he challenges us with wisdom on the people that are annoying to us, the people that need a good slap upside the head, the people that need to be paid back. Uh, they're just people. Let's look at them through the lens of Scripture. Verse 13 of 1 Peter 3, who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. That is Isaiah 8, verse 12 through 13. And it's talking about conspiracy theories. Don't be shaken up by them. Don't be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Why? God has got it going on, folks. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, respect. That's what we attempted to do today. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. The words of wisdom for today that came from the Bible will change your life, demonstrating the reliability of the Scriptures. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your awesome word. I pray, Lord, that you would change our lives in such a way that we wouldn't think of making decisions without consulting your word, without discussing with those we trust who may have more knowledge of your word. Help us to all become disciples of your scriptures. In Jesus' name, Lord, may we be people that honor you with our lips, but also our hearts. 
with our mouths, but also our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship the Lord. Isaiah 61 1 tells how there's anointing on Jesus and sure enough it confirms that word in Luke 4 as he stands in the synagogue he speaks what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us here today the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and I might say that he's also sent to those who are physically broken. Not just in your heart, but in your body. To preach deliverance to the captives. Do we need deliverance from sin? Do we need deliverance from the darkness? We can be set free because of the finished work of the cross. Recovering of sight to the blind. Have we been spiritually blind? Are we having problems with eyesight? Are we physically blind? And to set at liberty them who are bruised. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Glory to God for the year of Jubilee. Christ was anointed to do those things. He died for our sins. He still does those things through his people. For he sent the, his Holy Spirit to anoint us. So in this room are people who will pray with you about any prayer request you have. There's no need too small or too great. Wherever you would need prayer, we would love to pray with you. So if you would like for someone to pray with you. We won't make a show of you or embarrass you. We will just come to you. If you'd like to receive prayer for a request you have, it could be spiritual, physical, financial, any kind of need, relational, we're here to pray with you because the Lord is anointed to make a difference, to line lives up with his will. So if you could use some prayer, can you just hold your hand up and keep it up? All right, I see hands. Any more hands? All right, members of the body of Christ, you've been anointed to pray, to bring blessing to the brokenhearted, recovery of sight to the blind, freedom to those that need deliverance. Go to these hands that are raised and pray with them. As the musicians play, if you're not going to pray with anyone, turn to someone and say, hey, can I pray with you about anything? You have the freedom to do that. Or 
freedom to worship and pray from a distance for those that are receiving prayer. Lord, we thank you for the power of prayer. Thank you, Lord, you've anointed us to minister your life. Thank you, Lord, for things that are going to happen right now as we pray. Thank you, Jesus.